Well, welcome to Module 2, where we'll be covering sickness and healing from an anthropological point of view. You're going to have six modules here that are going to cover chapters 1, 2, and 4 in the Han textbook. Uh, chapter 2 is a, is a bit dense and information heavy, so we'll have three modules uh, to cover chapter 2. I'll try to break them up a little bit. Uh, so let's begin with um, chapter 1 in your Han textbook. These, the reason why I'm spending some time on these four chapters in the Han textbook, chapters 1, 2, and 4, is because they're going to lay the foundation uh, for much of the discussion uh, to follow. So let's begin in this module 2, part 1, with a discussion of chapter 1 in the Han textbook. Um, I should also mention that we're going to cover the introduction here a bit, so you need to make sure you've read the introduction and chapter 1 before you view this module. Now, what, what I'm doing here is I'm just hitting the high points of the material covered in the, in the readings. Uh, I certainly assume uh, that you have done the reading carefully before you view these modules. And I'm not necessarily going to touch on everything, so you're responsible for all the material. But what I'm going to do is just focus on those topics in the chapter that I think are essential for your study of ethnomedicine. <laughs> okay, well, let's, let's start with the introduction. And you want to have your textbook available close by because we'll be reading passages from time to time. Han begins by noting that there are two basic mindsets when it comes to the issue of ethnomedicine today. One mindset is that there is a hierarchy of medical systems with biomedicine. Biomedicine is Western medicine, the type of medicine we practice. So there's a hierarchy with biomedicine at the top and all other forms of medicine from the various cultures ranked below it. He refers to that model as ethnocentric. Ethnocentric meaning that it assumes that there is an absolute standard, an absolute cultural standard, with that standard being your own, hence the term ethnocentric. At the other extreme, we have the notion that all medical systems are equally valid and equally useful, and they simply need to be understood in their local context for us to see that. Now, he refers to this view as xenocentric, X-E-N-O, xeno having to do with the other, the outsider. So xenocentric uh, would sort of presuppose that there is truth in all medical systems. Well, of course, Han, as an anthropologist, would come down somewhere in that gray area between these two extremes. Certainly, biomedicine arguably is the most valid medical system we have in the world, given its quote-unquote scientific basis, uh, its empiricism, induction and deduction, etc. But while it may be the most valid, certainly that does not mean that the other systems don't have something to offer. So he comes down somewhere in between these two approaches. And finally, in the introduction, Han gives us his notion of sickness. And he explains it like this. Number one, it's an unwanted condition in one's person. And number two, it's based on the perceptions and experiences of the individual. So sickness is not necessarily something that's diagnosed by someone else. It very much depends on an individual's perception and experiences. Okay, so let's move on to chapter one, the universe of sickness. A question comes up near the beginning of the chapter. Is there one reality or dimension of sickness, or are there many such realities? In other words, is, is sickness a universal uh, phenomenon? Or are there 
things going on cross-culturally that give us different perspectives on sickness. This comes up in a discussion of so-called culture-bound syndromes. A culture-bound syndrome is a sickness that's assumed to be local. It doesn't occur anywhere else and it's endemic in one particular area. That is the assumption. There are some interesting quote-unquote local sicknesses out there in the world. For example, amok. These are violent and uncontrollable outbursts followed by depression, despondency, lethargy, etc. We find this in Southeast Asia. Uh, there's something interesting called Pora Keri Dohari in, in which uh, this occurs in Colombia, uh, in which a shaman uh, supposedly builds a fence around the uterus of a pregnant female. And now in our minds, and obviously that would cause a problem, we would simply refer to that as a breech birth. But in their mind, a breech birth is caused by that malady, Pora Keri Dohari. Uh, there's something called Susto that's recognized in Central and South America. Uh, it's, thought to, it's thought to be caused by the loss of the soul. A person loses their appetite, they become unmotivated, depressed, and the way you cure it is to restore uh, the soul to that person. You have another interesting malady called Koro, K-O-R-O, which is the so-called shrinking penis malady, where men suffer from the anxiety that they are actually losing their penis. It's disappearing in their body. Uh, we find this in Asia, some parts of Africa. And then there was Kuru, a local sickness that was found in Papua New Guinea. It's basically a transmissible encephalopathy uh, caused by a prion or a abnormal protein and apparently people were practicing ritualistic cannibalism and they were consuming uh, infected flesh and thus it was being passed down. Interesting local sickness there. Of course I'm using the term local sickness here. We're gonna we're gonna be uh, taking that apart a little bit later because there are some in fact who do not believe that culture bound syndromes uh, is a valid term at all. So we'll be we'll be addressing that. Hahn also discusses what's called a nosology, which is a classification or typology of sickness. And of course, all groups have their unique uh, culturally based nosologies. One example of a local nosology uh, is found among the Ndembu people uh, in Southern Africa, a tribal, tribal group in Southern Africa. Uh, they believe that uh, sickness is caused by mystical forces. Uh, of course, I mean, that, that, that's one cause of sickness. It can be caused by mystical forces. Of course, they, they stub their toes, they get infections, they burn themselves like everybody else. Uh, but some sickness is caused by mystical forces. And not surprisingly, they don't really make a distinction between the natural uh, or corporeal world and the ethereal or spiritual world. And so that would uh, help us understand why they're so susceptible to mystical forces. A lot of their treatments are symbolic of the malady they're suffering from. So for example, if you look at page 17, you can read about their interesting cure for insanity. I'm looking at the second paragraph on page 17. Treatment for insanity involves medicines concocted from the old bones of a mad dog, a fruit associated with revelation and clarity, parts of the leopard which kills without reason, the wild pig which moves at random, and the mavundu fish which may swim upside down. The leaves of a plant from the top of termite hills are used because the insane seem to be above things. He wanders about in the air, talks in the air. This disease of insanity comes in the air. Its remedy works through mimicry. So here we have a, a cure that is highly symbolic. And then, of course, uh, we have our own nosology. Uh, it's referred, well, it's, it's, it's part of the medical system we refer to as biomedicine. And, in fact, we have an actual uh, hard copy of our nosology, and it's the International Classification of Diseases, the 10th revision, so the so-called ICD-10. It's in its 10th revision. And 
our nosology is based primarily on empirical uh, data, observation, uh, science, as we would broadly refer to it. However, social and political factors are also relevant. So especially in regard to issues such as sexual orientation, women's health, and so forth. So how do we reconcile all of these different medical systems we find around the world? Well, Han has an interesting quote on page 19. Look at the top of page 19. Answers to these questions are vital for the way sickness and healing are understood and confronted in societies. A society in which sickness is thought to be defined and caused by anatomical and physiological alterations will focus on these physical characteristics of persons in seeking prevention or cure. Since afflicted persons may be unable to assess their own anatomy and physiology, such a system of medicine may not listen to their complaints or accounts. And here he is largely describing biomedicine. To continue, in contrast, society in which sickness is thought to be defined by human experience and caused by human interactions, and here we're talking about a lot of ethnomedical systems, physiological as well as social, may attend more to its social organization and the understandings of its patients in, in addressing prevention and cure. How we think of sickness and the different kinds of sickness shapes our response, diagnosis, and treatment. Okay, next Han takes on the so-called unity of sickness, and there are two basic pro approaches here. One is realism, and the perspective of realism says that all humans suffer from the same basic problems, right? We all share one universal you know, physiology, one universal anatomy, etc., and therefore we all suffer from the same basic problems. Uh, we may perceive them differently, but this is, these are just superficial differences. In general, because we're similar, physiologically and biologically, we suffer from the same issues. That's realism. On the other hand now, there's something called nominalism, which says there's no real universals at all, and medical conditions vary greatly cross-culturally. And so, from the perspective of nominalism, the notion of culture-bound sickness or local sicknesses becomes valid. Han's position lies, and my own as well, lies somewhere between realism and nominalism. Uh, of course, there are human universals, and we are all susceptible to specific pathogens in the very same way, and we respond to them in the very same way, physiologically, biochemically, etc. But yet, on the other hand, there's also cultural ideology, which uh, causes us to perceive things slightly differently. In this chapter, he also discusses metapathology, which are uh, pathologies or disorders that impair the individual's ability to assess or diagnose sickness. So, for example, somatization. In this case, psychological conditions or mental issues are incorrectly diagnosed as physical or bodily conditions. This is common in China, for example, where, where mental conditions or psychological issues are stigmatized. There's also something called psychologization, and this is just the opposite or the converse. In this case, physical or physiological issues are incorrectly diagnosed as being psychological or mental conditions. Uh, so, for example, the religion known as Christian science attributes physical maladies to a lack of spiritual harmony. We also have something called hyperesthesia, and this is where an individual exaggerates a condition, and hypoesthesia, where an individual minimizes or denies a condition. In his discussion of dimensions of sickness, there are five primary things that are discussed here. First, accounts of sickness. And this refers to cross-cultural conceptions and understandings of sickness. And things like etiology, pathophysiology, treatment, diagnoses, things like that are relevant in regard to accounts of sickness. Second, we have cultural conceptions of sickness. To give you some examples of what we're referring to here, uh, in some African cultures, it's thought that sickness can be caused by grudges or even witchcraft. In Western cultures, such as our own, stress is thought to be a cause of sickness. And in some Chinese cultures, 
Sickness is thought to be due to cosmic imbalance. So these are all different cultural conceptions of sickness. Number three under dimensions of sickness is sickness experiences. An individual's sickness experience is greatly influenced by the culture in which they were raised. Uh, people are working with different cultural ideologies as a result of undergoing enculturation in a specific culture. Enculturation refers to the process whereby an individual learns their culture. So by virtue of being taught different cultural ideologies, we perceive sickness differently. Number four, sickness-related roles. And here we're talking about uh, those individuals who are uh, healing specialists. So for example, uh, we have physicians, our doctors in our own culture. Uh, we have OBEAMEN, O-B-E-A-H dash M-E-N, in the Caribbean. And these are ethnomedical healers in the Caribbean. We have curanderos, C-U-R-A-N-D-E-R-O, or curanderas for females. And these are traditional healers in Central America. Uh, and we also have shamans, S-H-A-M-A-N. Uh, shamans uh, have been around about as long as human cultures have been around. And these are traditional healers you find all around the world. And then finally, number five, causes of sickness. And here we get into a discussion of necessary and sufficient causes of sickness. And there's a separate module on that. So I'll just uh, leave that for that separate module. Okay, another point that's made by Han in this chapter that's important is that all medical systems, be they biomedical or ethnomedicine from wherever, they're all cultural to some extent. In other words, they're not all strictly logical, empirical, and, sci and scientific. They're all cultural to some extent, and therefore they're all flawed for that reason. Thus, they can all be considered to be approximations of the truth. And as I said earlier, perhaps while it is true that biomedicine is closer to quote-unquote the truth than other non-Western medical systems, even it is still vulnerable to social, political, even religious influences. We also need to consider, too, that schizophrenia actually has been treated more effectively in some developing nations, for example, Africa and India, than it has here in the West. You can read about that on page 37. Of course, one of my theories regarding why that's the case is that with traditional cultures, often we're dealing with cultures that are more homogeneous. Everyone is on the same page, so to speak, in regard to religion, diet, political ideology, gender ideology, etc. Where in Western nations, we're dealing with societies that are characterized by cultural heterogeneity. Lots of different notions regarding gender roles, religion, political ideology, etc. Why is that important? Well, because schizophrenia can be considered to be an estrangement from cultural reality. In fact, individuals are so estranged that they will create their own cultural reality. Well, if you think about it, it's a little bit easier to bring someone back, quote unquote, if there is a common basis that serves as the baseline. So we, every, it's, it's understood what we're bringing them back to. There's a common universal agreement in developing cultures. In Western cultures, however, there is no quote-unquote you know, fundamental uh, baseline of cultural ideology. Therefore, it's much more difficult to reintegrate a person back into that culture. That's just my take on it. And then finally, towards the end of the chapter, Han makes the point that while biomedical science continues to, re to refine its techniques and epistemology, uh, it should nevertheless seek to broaden its perspective by recognizing that sickness and healing are understood and dealt with in many, many different ways cross-culturally. So in other words, we need to bring a dose of anthropology to biomedicine. And there are some quotes that pertain to that issue on page 38 and 39.